a sermon no less fruitful than famous made in the year of our Lord God, 1388. In these are latter days most necessary to be known, neither adding nor diminishing from save the old and rude English thereof mended here and there. Preached by Thomas Wimbledon, printed in 1550 by Richard Grafton and Richard Keel. Note, this sermon was found hidden in a wall. To the Christian reader, lo, Christian reader, while the world, not slumbered, but routed and snorted in the dope and the dead sleep of ignorance, some lively spirits were wakening, and ceased not to call upon the drowsy multitude of men, and to stir them up from the long dreams of sinful living, and that ones at the last they would creep out of darkness, and come forth to the hot shining sun of God's word, that both the filthy mists and their hearts might be driven away, and also their heavy and dying spirits recreated, refreshed, and quickened, so that no man can allege that in any age there wanted preachers of God's word. For he that keepeth Israel sleepeth not, nay slumbereth, and though thorough his secret counsel, he sendeth more laborers into his harvest at one time than at another, yet he hath ever some to weed, to reap together, sheaves together into the barns of everlasting life. Read therefore diligently this little sermon, Siphon's written, and thou shalt perceive the same quick spirit in the author thereof that thou now marvelest at in other of our time. He sharply, earnestly, and wittily rebuketh the sins of all sorts of men, and speaketh as one having authority, and as the scribes, the Pharisees, which with their leaded and blunt darts could never touch the quick, though they have occupied and worn the pulpits so many years. The word of God is lively, and mighty in operation, and sharper than any two-edged sword that cutteth even on unto the division of the soul and of the spirit and of the jointures and merry etc wherefore ever sons i exhort thee to read this little treatise diligently and not only to reverence antiquity and the lively spirit and the word of god therein but also to learn both to acknowledge and moreover to amend the wickedness of thy life Epigraph. Rede rationem vilacationes tue. Luke, chapter 16. Christ, the author and doctor of all truth, in his gospel, likeneth the kingdom of heaven to a householder, saying on the wise, Like is the kingdom of heaven to a householding man that went forth first in the morning to hear work, men into his vineyard, so did he about the third hour, the sixth, the ninth, and the eleventh. And as he found men standing idle, he said to them, Why stand ye here unoccupied? Go ye into my vineyard, and that that is dwelleth, I shall give you. And when the day was ended, he called his steward, and bade that he should give every man a penny. Spiritually, this householder is our master, the Lord Christ, the true householder and head of his church here in earth, which calleth men in diverse hours of the day that is in diverse ages of the world. As in the time of nature, he called by inspiration Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and other like. In the time of the old law, he called Moses, David, Isaiah, and Jeremiah with the prophets, and in the time of grace he called the apostles, martyrs, confessors, and virgins. He called also some childhood as John Baptist, some in their youth as John the Evangelist, some in the Middle Age as Peter and Andrew, some in their latter days as Gamaliel and Joseph and Briamath, and all those he called to labor in the Lord's vineyard, that is his church. Yea, that sundry ways, for right as ye see, that in the trimming of this material vine there be diverse laborers, for some cut away the branches that be void, some underset and lay abroad the vine, yea, some pare away the old earth and lay new to the root, 
which offices all be so necessary to the vine, that if any of them fail or want, it shall be either let or utterly destroy the grow vine, growing of the vine. For unless the vine be cut, she will wax wild, except she be railed up and laid abroad, weeds and nettles will soon overgrow her. And if the root be not fatted with new and fresh dung for the feebleness, she shall wax bearing. No less needful in Christ's church be these there of priesthood, knighthood, and laborers. To priests or preachers it behooveth to cut away the void branches of sin with the sword of God's word. To knights it falleth to let wrongs and the hastes to be done to end to maintain God's law and them that be teachers thereof. Yea, and to keep the land from insurrection and invading of other lands. The laborers must labor bodily and with sore sweat get out of the earth bodily sustenance both for themselves and for other, and all these estates be so needful to the church that none may well be without other. For if priests wanted, the people, for default of knowledge of God's word, would wax wild in vices, and so die ghostly. And were not knighthood and men to rule people by law and hardness, thieves and enemies would so increase that no man could eve the peace. But for laborers, both priests and knights must come artificers, plowmen, and herds, or else must for default of bodily sustenance die, and therefore saith the great clerk of Vincenna, that ever unreasonable beast, if it have that, that nature and kind hath ordained for it, as kind givest it, is sufficient to live by himself without any other of the same kind, as if there were but one horse or one sheep in the world. Yet if he had come and giveth as nature and kind hath ordained or such a beast, he should live well enough. But if there were but one man in the world, although he had all the good that is therein, yet for default he should die, or his life should be worse than if he were not. And the cause is thus, for that thing that kind hath ordained for man's sustenance without other preparing or altering, then it hath of kind accordeth not to him. As if a man have corn, as it cometh from the earth, yet it is no meat according to him, until it be by maize craft changed into bread, and though he have flesh or fish, yet while it is raw, and not by man's labor sodden, roasted, broiled, or baked, it accordeth not to man's sustenance. Even so, the wool that the sheep beareth must needs by diverse crafts be altered and changed, or it be able to clothe any man, and really a man by himself should never do at those things, and therefore saith this clerk that it is needful that some be husbandmen, some men of occupations, some merchants to fetch that, that one land wanteth from other where is as plain nigh. As surely this one thing should be great cause why every estate should love other, and men of one craft should neither hate, neither despise men of another craft. For one of them is so needful to another that oftentimes those crafts that some most unhonest might worst be forborne. And thus I dare say that he that is not laboring in this world, either in praying and preaching, as behooveth the priests, for the health of the people, or in defending the causes of the needy, inciting against tyrants and enemies, which is the office of knights, or in laboring on the earth that pertaineth to the commons. When the day of reckoning shall come, that is the end of this life, right as he liveth here without labor or travail, so shall he want there the reward of the penny, that is the endless joy of heaven. And as he was living here, after no state, nor order, so shall he then be put into the place where is no order, but everlasting horror and sorrow, that is, hell. Wherefore every man see to what estate, 
God hath called him, and live therein by labor according to his degree. They that be laboring men, or craftsmen, do it truly. If thou be a servant or a bondsman, be subject, and live in dread, to displease thy master or lord for Christ's sake. If thou be a merchant, deceive not thy brother in chaffeting. If thou be a knight or a lord, defend the poor and needy man from such as would harm him. Thou being a judge or a justice, go not to the right hand for favor, nor into the left hand to punish for hate. Thou that are a priest then, instruct praise and reprove, instruct the ignorant, praise the obedient, and reprove the disobedient to God. Thus every man labor and travail after his degree. For when the evening cometh, that is, the end of the world, then shall every man take reward, good or bad, after as he hath labored here. These be the words that I have taken to entreat upon, and thus much to say in English. Come, give a reckoning of thy bailiwick. Christ, the authority of pity and lover of salvation of his people, in the process of the gospel, informeth every man that is his bailey, by the example of the bailey, that he monisheth to prepare himself to make his answer, and to give reckoning of such goods as he hath received of God's hand, and when the day of so straight a reckoning shall come, that is, the day of doom, and so I at this time thorough the help of God, following him that is master of so great authority, because I know nothing, that should more draw the way man unreasonable love from the vain and transitory joy of this world, than to have in mind that dreadful reckoning so far as God permitteth. I at this time will show you how you shall dispose you to avoid then God's ire and vengeance, when there shall be so hard judgment that we shall accompt for every idle word that we have spoken. For then shall be said unto us, and we shall have no power to go back. Come, give a reckoning of thy bailiwick. But for further process of this first part of this sermon, know you there be three bailiwicks that shall be called to this straight reckoning. The first shall answer for himself and for other, and they be priests that have other sight or cure of man's soul. The second temporal lords that have governance of people, and the third hailing shall accompt for himself, or at least have much less charge the other. And that is every Christian man, for that hath he received God. And every one of these shall answer to three questions. The first question, How hast thou entered? The second, How hast thou ruled? The third, How hast thou lived? And if thou can assail these three questions, and discharge thee of them, was there never earthly lord without comparison that so rewarded his servants as thy lord will reward thee? That is to say, with life and joy everlasting. But on the other side, if thou now regarding not thine own well high, take no heed of this reckoning, if death take the su thee suddenly, so that thou pass hence in deadly sin and evil life, and have not amended, as thou knowest not what shall befall thee, all the tongues that ever were or shall be cannot express the sorrow and woe that thou shalt suffer. Therefore, the desire of so great joy and the dread of so great pain, though the love of God were not in thine heart, should make thee to think evermore that thou shalt give a reckoning of thy bailiwick. Therefore, as I said, the first question that thou shall be proponed to the first daily, that is, a prelate or curate, is thus, How hast thou entered? Friend, how entredest thou hither? Who brought thee into thy office? Truth or simony? God or the devil? Grace or money? The flesh or the spirit? Give now thy reckoning if thou can. If thou cannot, I counsel thee without delay to learn. For in case thou be called thus, or it be night, and thee for the stand, dumb for lack of knowledge and for confusion of thin thine own conscience, thou shalt fall into the sentence that here ensueth. 
bind his hands and feet and cast him into utter darkness where is wailing and genting of teeth therefore i counsel that thou advise the well how thou wilt answer to this question how hast thou entered whether by calling or by thine own procuring for that thou wouldest labor in god's gospel or for that thou wouldest be richly arrayed answer to thine own conscience now as thou shalt or it be long answered to god thou that hast taken the order of priesthood on the whether thou be curate or two who stirred thee to take so high an estate upon thy whether because thou wouldest live in god's contemplation and study of god's word to instruct the people or for to live a delicious life of other men's sweet and thyself to labor never a whit and here might i ask a question why also set men their children to school whether for to get them great advances meets or to make it them the better to know god and serve him this their intention men may see openly by the sciences that they put them to for they set them to the canon civil or to the temporal law not as to be ministers of justice to defend the poor and right etc but because they think that these sciences shall be means to make them great men in the world and why be there so few put to learn the word of god and to the preachers thereof but that there is no such gayness as in the other and so care they little on both parts for godly living and truth it is that saint john chrysostom saith parents be lo loving to the bodies of their children but the souls they regard not they desire their welfare in this world but they pass not what they shall suffer in another some ordain great fees for thee here but none ordain they them go forward the loss of their bodies they will sore bewail but the health of their souls they make no reckoning of if they see them poor they sorrow and sigh but though they see them sin they make no manner of moon and hereby they show that they bought forth their bodies but not their souls and now to speak again of priests if we take heed truly we shall perceive great abominations that been scattered in the church nowadays by and amongst priests we shall perceive i say that they come not into christ's fold by christ's calling for to profit but by other means and ways to get themselves worldly wealth and this is cause of many errors among the people and therefore it is written in the book of mourning where the prophet speaketh thus to god the enemy hath put his hand to all things to him desirable for that he hath seen a certain people lawless entering into the sanctuary of which thou hadst commanded that they should not enter that is to say into the church the enemy is satan's and his name suddeneth that hath put his hand to all him liketh for what sin might defend by all his craft or energy have sowed among men that is not nowadays used when were they so great in half as they now be in what plenty is pride envy wrath and covetous and likeness of all other sins and wherefore thinkest thou but for because there be lawless people entered into the temple that neither in themself keep the law of god nor can teach the other and to all such saith god by the prophet hosea for that thou hast put away cunning or knowledge of god's will i will put thee away that thou shalt use no priesthood to me perceive that god and holy scripture expressly here forbiddeth men the state of priesthood upon them but if they have cunning that needeth or behoveth them 
thou then canst neither rule thyself nor other after the law of God, beware how thou wilt answer God at this dreadful doom, and he shall say to thee, Come, give a reckoning of thy daily wick. The second question that any prelate or curate must answer to is this, How hast thou ruled? That is to say, the souls of the subject and the goods of poor men give thy account. First, how thou hast governed God's flock committed to thy cure. As a hardy or as a hired man that doth all for his bodily hire, as a father or as a wolf that eateth the sheep and keepeth them not, say on and tell me, say whom thou hast turned from their cursed living by the devout, devout preaching and good example, whom hast thou taught the law of God that was before ignorant? There shall be hard a grievous accusing of fatheries children and straying alleging of all the flock that thou hast take of them thy living through their labor and sweat and do nothing therefore but let them go astray wandering from pasture and water and not giving them by thee. Directly give thy reckoning how hast thou ruled and spended the goods of these poor men how shalt thou tremble with horrible fear? Then thinkest thou, hear what St. Bernard saith, threatening clerks and threatening ministers of the church. They be in the place of saints, and they do wickedly, in that they not holding them content with wages that are sufficient to their necess necessaries, but the overplus that need should be sustained by, they be not ashamed to waste in the houses of their pride and lechery, withholding to them self-wickedly and cursedly the livings of poor men, with double wickedness truly. First, they do sin, for they rob other men of their goods. Furthermore, for that they misuse holy things in their vanities, and in their wickedness, every such bailey therefore beware, for to the last far thing thou shalt reckon and give account. Thinkest thou then that thou shalt not be disallowed of God for that thou hast misspended, and in bringing up of young idle followers, nourished or taught as it were in a school to blaspheme. God in all manner of points of evil living, in feeding and fattening palfreys, of housing and hawks, and if so be that is worst of all on lecherous women. Hear what is said of such. They have led their days in vanity and in wealth. In a moment they be gone down to hell. Think not, therefore, but that thou shalt render straightly the account of thy bailiwick. And third question that he shall answer to is this. How hast thou lived? What light of holiness hast thou given? showed to the people in thy living. What mirror hast thou been unto them? Now give thy reckoning. How hast thou lived as a good shepherd, going before his flock with good examples, or as a lewd person, as a man or beast? It is to wonder truly to see how the life of priests is changed. They be clothed like lords and knights. They speak as unhonestly as any ribald or harlot. As covetously for gains do they procure as any merchants. They ride like princes, and all that, all this that thus is spent is of poor men's goods and of Christ's heritage. Therefore, saith the holy doctor, the clay of Egypt is so sticking and meddled with blood, and the slates were hard to be undone, for they were taken with the fire of covetous and with the lair of earth of lusts. In this point do travail rich men, and in this watch they, laying a weight for poor men. In this travail prelates that be blinded with too much shining of riches, that maketh them houses like churches in greatness, and superfluous abundance of all things, that which diverse painters color they their chambers, and with divers silks and clothings in sundry colors make their images gay. But the poor man for default of clothes beggeth, and with an empty
empty whom doth cry at the door. And shall I say, so saith this doctor, oftentimes these poor men be robbed for to cloth stocks and stones. To such speaketh the prophet Isaiah, Who art thou here, or as who art thou here? Here thou art occupying the place of Peter, of Paul, of Thomas, or of Martin. But how, as Judas was amongst the apostles, Simon Magnus amongst the disciples, as a candle newly quenched that fumeth over all the house, instead of a light lantern, and as a smoke that blindeth men, even instead of a clear fire. If thou contrary thus the manner of living that Christ and his apostles left to priests. Therefore saith the prophet Jeremiah, they have entered, and they have had, and they have not be obedient with false title and corrupt intention. They have entered, they have had poor men's goods to their misusing, and they have not been obedient to God in their living. Therefore it is written that they shall have the hardest doom, the hard doom or judgment, for that they have misentered, a harder judgment, for that they have misruled, the hardest judgment, for because they have so cursedly lived. Beyond all other, wherefore I counsel thee betimes, think how thou wilt make thy reckoning. The second Bailey, that must answer for himself and for other, is he that hath the rule of any realm, province, shire, or countries as kings, princes, mayors, sheriffs, and justices. And these shall also answer to three questions. The first, how hast thou entered in thy office, whether to profit the people, to destroy falsehood and further truth, or for the desire to obtain thereby worldly worship and riches, if thou take such an office more for thine own worldly profit than for to heal the community wealth, thou art none of the perfect members of the church, but art a tyrant. And it is to be feared lest there be many that desire such a state, some that they may be in haste with riches, and some that they might the rather oppress such they hate and some be enhanced in taking gifts, whereby they spare to punish those that have trespassed, and so make the pertners of their sins, and for bribes they work all things. And many such, when they be so high in office, think not that they be poor men's sons, brethren, and servants to the defense of the commons, but think themselves to be of a higher kind of nature, as they be advanced to worldly honor, which is but wind and vanity, of whom saith God by the prophet, They have reigned, but not by me. They have been princes, but I know them not. So was Roboam king Solomon's son, when he was first king, advanced in his heart, when the people of Israel came to him and said, Thy father in his last days put upon us a great charge. We desire thee that thou wouldest make it lighter, and we will serve thee. The king asked counsel to the older wise men, which advised him to answer them fair, and that should be best. But he forsook these wise men's counsels, and did after children that were his playfellows, and said to the people, when they came again, my least finger is bigger than my father's ring bone. My father grieved you somewhat, but I will add more. The people hearing this rebelled against him. And sithen the time came never the kingdom whole together again. Wherefore it is good for rulers to take sober counsel and to eschew ear crowners, and always to have an eye of love to the commons, that they rule. For know they well, be they never so high, that they shall come before a higher judge to give a reckoning. The second question, how hast thou ruled, is 
that is the people and the office that thou hadst to govern. Thou that hast been a judge in causes of poor men, how hast thou kept this commandment of God, that thou shalt not take heed to the person of the poor man, to be the harder to him for his poverty? Nor thou shalt have respect to the rich man's countenance, to spare or favor him in wrong for his riches. O Lord God, what abusion is there among officers of both parties nowadays, if a great man pleat with a poor man to have aught that he holdeth? Every officer shall be ready to further all that he may the rich man in his cause, that he may have the end that he desireth. But if a poor man pleat with the rich, then shall there be so many delays, that though the poor man's right be open to all the country for pure default of spending, he shall be constrained to let his cause fall. Sheriffs and bailiffs will return poor men's writs with a tardy venet, except they feel money in their hands. And yet I hear say of men that have proved both courts that the court that is called more spiritual or Christian is more cursed. Therefore it is truly said, gifts they take out of men's bosoms to subvert the ways of right judgment. But in a special the words of Christ be to feared. In what judgment ye shall judge other, yourself shall receive the same as ye measure to other, etc. When ye shall come to give your account. The third question, how hast thou lived, thou that judgeth and punisheth other for trespassing? It behooveth thee that punisheth other men for their trespasses to eschew and flee the wickedness of them. For if thyself do unlawfully judging other, thou condemnest thyself, sith thou doest that thing that thou damnest, Paul saith. Why teachest thou not thyself that teachest other? Why stealest thou that teacheth other men nor to steal? How shall that man take rule of other that cannot go before thee in good living? And when any man standeth before him in judgment, he must take heed before what judge he shall stand himself, to take his judgment after his deeds. But it is to be feared that many fare as to the two false priests that would have damned to death holy Susan, for that she would not consent unto their lechery. Of the which it is written, they turned away their eyes for that they would not see heaven, nor have mind of right judgment. And so it fortuneth of that they which are more worthy to be hanged, damned, than that they be less worthy. As Socrates the philosopher, who on a time was demanded why he did laugh, for eyes, said he, great thieves lead a little thief to hanging. I pray you whether is he a greater thief that taketh away a man's house and his land from him, or his heirs for evermore, or he that for greed stealeth a sheep or a calf. And suppose you that so time we have not such judges, and men of law themself very excorcion and briberous, they that judge other to death. But I advise thee, that judgest other men, to remember that thou shalt come into judgment, and give reckoning of thy bailiwick. The third bailey, that shall be called the, to this dreadful doom, shall every Christian man, that shall receive to his Lord God for the goods that he hath had of his. And here I will speak but of this question. That is, how hast thou governed thee and thy goods, and how hast thou entered here to thy goods? Beware ye that have gotten any goods wrongfully, either taken by extortion, by stealth usury, or deceit. Who shall be to you at this dreadful day? For as St. Austin saith, 
if he be cast into the fire that has not given of his own goods righteously gotten, where, where thinkest thou that he shall be cast that hath stolen other men's goods? And if he shall bren with the fend, then that hath not clothed the naked, where judgest thou that he shall bren that hath made naked that were clothed? But two things make men thus to live by rape of other men's goods, that is, desire of honor and dread of poverty. And what vengeance falleth on this sin of covetous, ye mayest by figure of scripture, when the angel said to the prophet Zachary, Lift up thine eyes and see what is that goeth out, that the prophet asked what is that. Then the angel said this, is the pot going out that is the eye of the earth and there was a weight of lead and there was a woman sitting in the midst of the pot and he took the gobbet of lead and cast it into the pot's mouth the woman's name was Un, and the prophet lift up his iron and say to women like spirits in the air with wings like unto kites or Kudokites, and they carried up the pot between heaven and earth, and the prophet asked the angel whither they would carry this pot, and he said into the land of Samari, The pot is covetous, for as the pot hath a wide open mouth, so covetousness gapeth evermore after worldly good, riches, and honor. And as the lycor of the pot profiteth not to the pot self, but them that draw drink thereof, so worldly good oft profiteth not the keeper, but other that come after, as it is written, He that hath money shall have no fruit of it. And this covetous is the eye of covetous men, for they be blind to see how they should come to heaven. But to win worldly things, they can see many ways, like to owls and night crews, the better see by night than by day. The pace of lead is the sin of obstination. The woman sitting in the pot is unpiety, as the angel saith that followeth, and companion of avarice. The man through avarice doth lose the piety that he should have of the mischief of his soul, siphons often men less the life of their soul by deadly sin that they commit to get riches, and also they lose the piety that they should have to their bodies, putting themselves so many great perils and leopardies of their bodies, both by say, sea and by land, and lesseth compassion towards other man, and all maketh covetous. The pot is stopped with this gobbet and lead when unpiety is closed thus by sin of obstination, by covetousness that it may not go out of the keeper's heart, by repentance. As Job saith, when he is filled he shall be stopped. The second woman that bare up the pot were pride and lust of flesh, that is the scripture, be called the two daughters of the water leech, crying, Bring, bring, and they had wings. The first woman is that pride, hath two wings, the first wing be graces or gifts spiritual, as cunning wisdom, counsels, and such other, for which gifts oft men were proud. The second wing is bodily grace, or gifts as strength, beauty, alchemy, and such other, of which often men wax proud. The wings of the second woman be fleshly desires, and they be gluttony, and sloth of gluttony speaketh the holy doctor St. Gregory, saying, When the belly is filled, the pricks of lechery be stirred, of sloth saith the great doctor St. Austin, that loth, while he was in business dwelling amongst the shrows in Sodom, he was a good man. But when he was high idle in drunkenness, he lay by his own daughters. And these women had wings like glades, or put 
talks that with crying voice go seeking their meat, as Bartholomeus saith. Thus fareth the covetous and fervent desire of fleshly men, as witness St. Austin. We see saith that he ravenous fishes have some measure, for when they hogger they do rape and eat, but when they be full they spare. Only covetous men may not be fulfilled or satisfied. Ever he taketh, and never hath he enough, neither dreadeth he God or shame of men, neither spare he father, neither knoweth mother, with his brother accordeth he not, nor with his friend keepeth, keepeth he truth. He oppresseth widows, and harmeth motherless children. Free men he maketh bond, and bringeth forth false witness, he occupieth dead men's goods, as though he never should die. What madness is this, saith this doctor thus to less life and grace, and procure the soul's damnation, to win gold, and lose heaven, and therefore saith the prophet, unhappiness shall compass them round about, travail and unrighteousness in the minds among them. Also, Innocentius speaketh of this harm that cometh of covetousness, saith, O oh, how many men hath covetousness deceived and spilled, for covetousness of reward of gifts that the king Balak promised Balaam he would have cursed the people of God. Notwithstanding, his own ass reproved him in his own conscience, and all that was in him reproved and hurt his form at the wall. And yet he was overcome and led away with covetousness, which enforced him what he might. Ak en was stoned, for covetousness made him steal gold and precious clothes against God commandments. Isi was strike with misery, for that sold a man's health. That came by the grace of God. Judas, for covetousness, sold Christ, and afterward hanged himself. An Emmy, Sapphira, and his wife died suddenly, for because they denied to Peter the price or sum of money that they received. Covetous is cause that rich men eat poor men, even as beasts eat grass keeping it under. This is daily seen, for if a rich man have a field, and in the midst or on the outside a poor man have but one acre, or if a rich man have a whole street, save one house, that same poor brother of his oweth he never ceaseth till that he have gotten that one of the poor man's hand. Other, by praying or entreating or pursuing, thus fareth it by King Akab, that by the procurement of his false queen, Isabella, slew the poor man Naboth, for that he would not sell him his vineyard living and his palace. Whereupon St. Ambrose saith, How far will ye rich men stretch out your covetousness? Will ye dwell alone upon the earth and have no poor men with you? Why put you out your fellow in kind and challenge to yourself the possession? that kind and nature hath made common to all men, both poor and rich. The earth was made common, and will ye rich men challenge proper sight, therein nature and kind knoweth no riches, for she bringeth forth all manner of men poor. We be not gotten with rich clothes, no, nor born with gold and silver. Naked bringeth us nature and kind into this world, both needy of meat and drink. Naked the earth taketh us again, as naked even as she bringeth us hither. And the sepulchre can she not close with us our possessions and riches. Kind maketh no difference between poor and rich, neither in coming hither, neither going hence. All after one manner bringeth she forth, all after one manner closeth she the grave. Whosoever maketh difference between poor and rich, 
Abide till they have livened a little space in the grave, and then open and look among the dead bones who was rich and who was poor. Except it be as thus, that mo clothes be rotten with the rich than with the poor, and that and damageth them that be alive, and profiteth not them that be dead. Thus saith the holy doctor of such exhortations, it is written, Other men's fells they reap, and of vine in his that hath been oppressed they pluck away the grapes. They leave men naked, and pluck away their clothes, that they have not wherewith to cover them from cold. And then they li lift up this pot, it I spake of before between heaven and earth, for covetousness of men, neither hath charity in earth to their brethren, nor to God of heaven. And then they bear this pot into the land of Sinir, that is to say, into the land of stench, that is, hell. For there is stench instead of sweet-smelling. Beware that thou go not with this pot, nor with the woman therein any case. Take heed that thou not marry with her, for then ye must be both one. This is the lecherous woman, and full of fleshly delights, with whom knights and merchants have committed lechery here on earth, and with her virtues they have been made rich, whose damnation is written in the books of Revelation of St. John by those words, In one day shall be her plagues come, death, sorrow, and hunger, and fire shall brain her. For strong is God that will avenge him on her. The kings of the earth that have done lechery with her, and have lived in her delights, when they shall see the smoke of her brenning, shall stand in fear of weeping and wailing, yea, crying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed with piss, purple and brassel, overgilt with gold and precious stones and pearl, for in one hour all these great riches shall be destroyed. Then shall they say that shall be damned with her, We have erred from the way of truth, and in the light of the righteousness that hath not shined upon us, the sun of understanding that hath not risen to us, we have been made weary in the way of wickedness and of lusts, and have not gone the hard ways, but the ways of truth we know not. That hath pride profited us for the best of our riches, what hath it brought unto us? All is gone as a shadow of death, and we can now show no manner of holiness to our kindred. In our wickedness we will be wasted away. Think, therefore, I counsel, how thou shalt give reckoning of thy bailiwick, when he shall say, Fede rationem vilicationis tue. The second part of this sermon. Here should be asked, How hast thou governed thy wife, thy children, and servants? Hast thou brought them up after the laws of God, and continued them there in as much as lieth in the power? But if thou hast brought them up after another way, or suffered them to go at their own will, think not but thou must give accounts therefore, when shall be said, Rede rationem vilicantionis tue. But, and if thou wilt avoid all the straight and hard accompts, I counsel thee whatsoever thou be to fall and cleave unto the mercy and goodness of God through Christ's demerits, with a lively faith and repenting here of thine iniquities. And now, therefore, beware of thy life in time past, and amend, and if thou do not, and that in time, who shall grant the pardon and release of thy accounts? In this second part, with the help of God, I will show first who shall call us to this reckoning, secondarily be for who we shall reckon, finally what punishment shall be to thee that be found false servants and wicked, and what reward shall be given thee that be found faithful and true servants. For the first three shall know that there be two judgments, the first anon after the departing of the body and the soul, which is a doom, whereof
of speaketh Luke in his gospel. The second doom shall be anon after the general resurrection, and that shall be universal. And of this speaketh St. Matthew, to the first shall every man be called one after another, as the world passeth. To the second shall we come all together to the twinkling of an eye, to the in men shall be called by three sonners and sergeants, the first sickness, the second age, the third death, the first warneth, the second trenteth, and the third taketh. This is a kindly order, but some time it falleth unkindly, for some die that never wist what was sickness nor age, as children that be suddenly slain. And so me, yea, and the most part nowadays that die, die before their pure and natural age of death. Therefore I say that the first that calleth us to this especial judgment is sickness, and this is double, for some is sickness that followeth all mankind, for that every man hath it, and some is sickness that some men have but not all, yea, the first sickness is double, for some is within in the midst of the soul, some is without in the feebleness of the body, that needs must be destroyed, in whom continuance of time himself is cause of corruption. As the philosopher saith that there be feebleness in sickness. Now may man see here that by that though a man shut out of his house, that is, his heart, all manner of worldly and fleshly thoughts, yet with all that ever he can do so shall he scapely suffice to think only on God the space of a print wheel. But some other thought of things that be passing entereth into his soul and draweth her from the contemplation. But, O oh, good God, what a sickness is this, and heavy burden, upon the sons of Adam, that on the foul muck and dung of the world we can think long enough, but on the Lord whom the soul should have most delectation by, we cannot think so little a space, but that the cockle will enter among the wheat. Of this sickness spake St. Paul, when he said, I see an utter law in my members, rebelling against the law of my spirit, and taking me to the law of sin, so that it fareth by us as it doth by man, that would look steadfastly ageth the sun, and cannot endure long for nothing, and yet for no default that is in the sun, for it is most clear in himself and so by reason best should be seen, but it for the feebleness of man's eyes. Right so, Synthon's Adam, our first father, was put out of paradise. All his of spring have been thus sick, and the prophet saith, Our fathers have eaten a bitter grape, and the teeth of their children be waxen on edge. The second sickness, that is, coming to all mankind, cometh of feebleness of body, as hunger, thirst, cold, heat, sorrow, weariness, and many other, as Job saith, and man that is born of a woman living in a, a light time is filled with many miseries, but there be other sicknesses that come to some men, but not to all, as leprosy, palsy, fevers, dropsies, blindness, and many other, as it is said to the people of Israel in Scripture. But if thou keep commandments that be written in the book of life, I shall increase thy sorrows and the, the sickness of thy seed, great sickness and long abiding, most evils, and always continuing. And ye shall understand that God sendeth such sickness other while to good men, and sometimes to shrews. To good men doth do it for two causes, and that I said of sickness, I would it to be understanding of all manner of tribulation. The first cause, for that they should ever know that they have no infection of the self, but of God only, and to increase meekness. Of this saith Paul, 
lest the greatness of revelation lift or extol me up into pride to me is given the prick of my flesh the angel of satan's to smite me on the neck wherefore i have thrice prayed god that it should go from me and he answered unto me my grace is sufficient for thee virtue is fulfilled in sickness within thus saith the gloss the fiend axing job to be tempted was hard and not the apostle axing his temptation to be removed god heard him that should be damned and he heard not him that he would save also god sendeth saints oftentimes sickness and persecution to give us sinful wretches example of patience for if he should suffer his saints to have such tribulation in this world and thank his thereof much more we wretches that god hath sent to not a hundredth part of their sorrow should bear it meekly sithens we have deserved a thousand times so much as they have wherefore as we read in thoby that on the day as he was weary of burgeoning the poor men the which should else have been unburied and have been eaten of hounds and fowls as the carrion of other unreasonable beasts as he for weariness has laid to rest thorough the sufferance of god the swallows that bred above in the house made order and donged in his iron whereby he weared blind this is written that god suffered this temptation to come to him for an example of patience to all that came after and so was also the temptation of holy job and though thobi from this chidal hold evermore did dread god and keep his commandments yet he was not ag aggrieved against god though that the mischievous blindness fell to him but unmeavably dwelled in the dread of god thanking him all the days of his life lo here scripture expressly saith that god suffered that holy man to have his sickness to give other that come after him an example of patience and also sometime god sendeth sickness and tribulation to wicked men and that for two causes first that they should love god and leave their sin as it is written their sickness are multiplied and after they hastened to godward for we see often men in sickness know their god that never would have turned to him while they were whole also god sendeth sickness often to against other men lest they should follow their sin and the sickness of antioch whom god smote with such a plague that worms scattered out of his body he being alive and the slick was so great and foul that his friends were weary therewith and might not suffer it yea at length he might not abide his own stench and they began he to know himself and say and said it is rightful to be subject to god and a mortal man not to hold him equal with god and the story saith that he asked mercy of god of whom he could have none and he made a vow to god that he would make the city of jerusalem free and the jews as free as the men of athens and that he would honor god's temple with precious stones and also array and multiply the holy vessels and find of his own aids the costs and expenses pertaining to the sacrifice and that he would become a jew and go over all the land preaching god's law and yet god gave him no mercy for no there was there in his contrition nor repentance that sprung of faith but of odious pain for what was in him to forsake his wickedness when he was unable to do good or evil and by this vengeance that god took on this king should men see what it is to be disobedient to god also it is to be taken heed that when sickness cometh ever it showeth that the patient is mortal and that he shall needs die 
and though he may escape this sickness, yet can be not a shoe death, and so he must needs come to the reckoning. The second Sumner that shall come to this sh that shall call to this peculiar judgment is age and feebleness, whose property is, although he tarry with thee, he will not leave thee till he hath brought thee to the endeth that is death. But there be many, though they have this sooner with them, yet they take no heed. He saith how his heed horreth, his back crooketh, his breath sticketh, his teeth falleth, his sight faileth, his ears wear heavy to hear. What meaneth all this but that age so openeth thee to the doom but what more madness can be than a man being called and drawn to so dreadful a reckoning where except he answer well he for fateth both body and soul to damnation for ever if he see a little mirth by the way he forgetteth who hath him by the sleeve so doth he that is stricken with age and hath so great pleasure in this world's wealth that he forgetteth whether he is away. Here for saith the a holy doctor that amongst all the abusions of the world most is of an old man that is obstinate, for he thinketh not of, of his outgoing of this world nor of his passing into the life to come. He heareth three messengers of death, but he believeth them not. And the cause is for the threefold cord that such an old man is bound with, is hard to break with cord is custom, that is, of plates, which be idle youth, unhonest speech, and wicked deed. The which, if they grow with the man from his childhood unto mass age, they make a threefold cord to bind the old man in custom of sin. Herefore saith Esay, Break the bonds of sin. Think therefore whosoever that thou be that art this so opened, thou canst not escape, but if thou must make thy reckoning, the third sooner to this reckoning is death, and this condition is that. Come he first, or come he last, he spareth neither poor nor rich, aged nor young, nor he feareth no threatening, he taketh heed to no prayer, nor of any gift, nor granteth any respite, but without delay he bringeth forth many to judgment. Therefore, says Dr. Austin, when ought every man to dread the day of death, for I, what a state soever man's last day, findeth him when he goeth out of this world, in the same estate it bringeth him to his judgment. Therefore saith the wise man's to his son, Son, think on thy last day, and thou shalt never sin. Now remember that thou shalt reckon for thy bailiwick. I said also that there was an other day of judgment to which all men shall come together in swinkling of an eye, and this shall be universal. And like as to the other, every man shall be called with th three sooners. So to this judgment all the world shall be called with three general sumners, and write as other three messengers show a man, and so do these messengers, till they of the world, the first is the world's sickness, the second is his age and feebleness, and the third is his end. The sickness of the world thou shalt know by charity warring cold, and his age and feebleness thou shalt know thy tokens fulfilled, and his end thou shalt know by antichrists pursuing. First I say, thou shalt know the world's sickness by charity waxing cold clerks that do write on natural things, that the body is sick, when that his kindly heart is so little, or when it is too much. 
the Sivans, then Sivans understand as thus, that all men is as one body whose kindly or natural heart is charity, that is love of God and love to thy neighbor. Unnatural or unkindly heart is lust, full love to the other creatures. When therefore thou seest that the love of men to Godward and to their neighbors is cold, little and faint, and the love to the world things is great and fervent, then know thou well that unkindly heat is too great, and unkindly heat is too little. That this is a knowledge of this sickness, I may prove by Christ's authority, for he himself gave this as a sign drawing to the end of the world, for that the wickedness shall be plenteous, charity shall wax cold. Therefore, when you seest charity thus little set by, of ye world and wickedness increase because the worldly things be most set by and loved, know well, it the world and his wealth passes, and that this sumner is come, and thus saith St. Paul, with thou well, that in the last days shall come perilous times, and shall be men judging themselves, that is to say, their bodies, all things belonging thereto, covetousness, born up with pride, unobedient to thee, father and mother, fellows without affection, without peace, blamers, uncontinent, unmild, without benignity, traitors, rebels swelling, lovers of lusts, more than of God, having a likeness of a petty, more than the virtue thereof, and these flee you when thou seest the people such fashion, know thou well, that the first Sumner warneth all the world, and that the day of reckoning draweth toward the second Sumner that shall warm all the world, is the age of the world, and this showeth tokens fulfilled already. But I know well that we be not sufficient to know the times that the Father hath put in his own power, and show certainly the day, the year, or the hour of judgment. This knowledge was hidden from the very apostles of Christ, and also from Christ's manhood, as to show it us. Nevertheless, we may, by authority of scriptures, with reason and expositions of holy men, well openly show it this day of wrath is nigh lest any man say in his heart, as it is written of a rich man, a foul belly server, that said, I will gather all the fruits and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you hast much goods lady up in store. For many years take thine ease, eat and drink, and be merry. I shall show you that this day is at hand, but how nigh I cannot say, nor will not. For if Paul said now, for a thousand and three hundred year and more past, we be those to whom Venice of the world become much more, may we say ye same that be so much near the end than he was also. St. John Chrysostom saith, Thou seest darkness over all, and why do test thou that the day is at an end? First on the valleys is darkness when the day draweth downward, when therefore thou seest the valleys dark. Why doest thou, whether it be near night or no? But if thou see the sun so low, its darkness be upon the hills, thou wilt say, doubtless, it is night right. So if thou see in the secular men that darkness of sin beginneth to have the mastery, it is a token that the world endeth. But when thou seest priestesses that be put in the top, or sufferance of spiritual dignity, and that should be as hills among the commonality of people in perfect living, that darkness of sin hath got the upper hand of them, who doubteth but it the world is at an end. Also Abbas Theochi in the exposition of Jeremy saith that from the year of our Lord one thousand two hundred 
all times be to be suspected, and we be past this suspect time nigh two hundred years, and made idolger, and ye book of her prophecies, if it be lawful to give them credit, in the third party, the eleventh vision, and the seventeenth chapter, moveth this reason. Right as in the seven thousand years the world shall pass, and as in the sixth day man was made and formed, so in six thousand years he was brought again and reformed, and as in the seventh day the world was full made, and God rested of his working, so in the seven thousandth year the number of them it shall be saved shall be fulfilled, and then shall ye saints wholly rest in body and soul. If then it be so, as it seemeth by thy maid's words, ye seven thousand years in passing of the world accord to ye seven days in making of it. Let us see what it wanteth, if these seven thousand years be not fulfilled. For if we number the years from the nativity of Christ to the years from the beginning of the world to Christ's coming following, the mind of Austin, Bede, Origen, and the perfectest doctor's teaching on this matter, it is past now almost six thousand and six hundred years, as it is open in the book called Speculu Judic Lali. So it followeth, if this day is more than half gone, if we should give credence to this maiden's reason, but if we lean to the Gospel of Matthew, we shall find, if the disciples asked of Christ three questions. First, what time the city of Jerusalem should be destroyed? The second, what tokens were of his coming to judgment? Third, what sign should be then of the world? And Christ gave no certain time of these things when they should fall, but he gave the tokens, by the which they might know when they drew near. To the first question of the destruction of Jerusalem, he said, When the Romans come to besiege the city, then sun after it shall be destroyed. And as to the second and the third, he gave them many tokens, as were these, that realm shall rise against realm, and people against people, and that their shutter, shoulder the opening of seven seals is declared the state of the church, from the time of Christ to the end of the world. The fourth, first seals show the estate of the church, from the time of Christ to the time of the Antichrist's appearing, and his foregoers, the which is showed in the opening of the other seals. The opening of the first seal telleth the state of the church in the time of preaching of Christ and his apostles. For then the first beast that is a lion gave his voice that betokeneth the preachers of Christ's resurrection and his ascension. For then went out a white horse, and he that sat upon him had a bow in his hand, and he went forth overcoming to overcome. By this white horse we understand the clean life and conversation that those preachers had, and by the bow their true preaching, pricking sorrow or repentance in men's heart for their sins without flattering. They went out of Jewry that they came of, winning and overcoming some of the Jews, and made them to leave the trust if they had in the old law to believe in Jesus Christ and follow his teaching, and they went out to overcome the Paynims, showing to them that their images were no gods, but man's work, unmighty to save thyself, and or any other drawing them to believe of Jesus Christ, God and man. In the opening of the second seal, there cried a calf, which was a beast, wont to be slain, and offered to God in the old law. This showeth the state of the church in the time of the martyrs, for their steadfast preaching, and for the truth of God's word, 
shed their blood, and that is betokened by the red horse that went out at the opening of this seal, and this estate began at Nero the cursed emperor, and endured to the time of Constantine, the great, that endowed the church. In this time many Christ's servants, and namely the leaders of Christ's flock, were slain, and of the twenty-two bishops of Rome that were before the time of Sylvester the first, I read but of four, but if they were martyrs, and also in the time of Diocletian, the emperor, the persecution of Christian men was so great that in thirty days were slain twenty-two thousand men and women in diverse countries for the law of God. The opening of the third seal telleth the state of the church in the time of heretics, that is, figured by the black horse or false understanding of scripture. For then cried the third beast, that is a man, for at that time it was needful for to preach the mystery of Christ's incarnation and passion against the heretics that take amiss these points, how Christ took every mankind of Mary, he being God as he was before, and his mother being made before and after. And the opening of the fourth seal telleth the state of the church in the time of hypocrites, that betokened by the pale horse. It be signs of penance without faiths to blind the people, and he that sat upon the horse, his name was Death, for they free ghostly them that they lead and teach to God by other ways than by Christ, and hell followeth them, for hell receiveth those that these men deceive. At that time shall be need that the fourth beast, that in the eagle flieth highest of all fowls, make this cry to raise up the gospel, and to praise God's law above all other, lest men's wit and their traditions tread down and overgrow the law of God by informing of these hypocrites. And this is the last estate that is or shall be in the church before the coming and clear appearing of the great member of Antichrist. The opening of the fifth seal showeth the state of the church that then shall follow, and the desire that the followers of the God's law shall have after the end of the world to be delivered of this woe. The opening of the sixth seal telleth the state of the church in the time of Antichrist's livings, which a state ye may know to be when ye see fulfilled, that St. John prophesied to fall in the opening of this seal, where he saith, After this I see four angrils standing upon four corners of the earth, holding the four winds that they blow not upon the earth, upon the sea, nor upon the trees. And four angels be the number of all the devil's ministers in that in those days, to do their master pleasure, shall stop the four winds that be the four gospels to be preached, and shall let the breath of the Holy Ghost to fall upon men, that they might mourn for their sin to amend their life, and also upon them that would increase virtue, and upon perfect men, the, what after this is to come but that the mystery of the seventh seal be showed, that he come in his own person, whom Jesus Christ shall slay the breath of his mouth, when the fiend shall show the uttermost persecution that he and his servants can do to Christian subjects, and that shall be the third warning, that the world shall have to come to this last judgment. In all this matter I have not said of myself, but of other doctors that be approved. I said also in my second principle that it was to be known before what judge we must reckon, that is, God himself. He hath seeth all our deeds and all our thoughts from the beginning of our life to the end, and he shall show there the hide things of our hearts, opening to all the world the righteousness of his judgment, so that by the power of God, Every man's deeds shall be showed to all the world, 
and so it seemeth by the worlds of words of St. John in the Apocalypse, where he see dead men great and little standing in the figure of the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened that was life. The dead men were judged after the things that were written in the books after their own doings. These books be men's conscience that now be closed, but then shall be opened to all the world to read therein, both their deeds and thoughts. And the book of life is Christ's living and doctrine that is hid now to them that shall be damned, thorough their own malice, that counsel men to follow the world rather than God. In the first book shall be written all that we have done, in the other all that we shall have done, and then shall dead men be judged after those things that be written in the books. And if the deeds that we have done and be written in the books of our conscience be according with the book of Christ's teaching and living, and the which is the book of life, we shall be saved. Or else we shall be damned, for the judgments shall be given after our works. Look therefore now what is written in the book of thy conscience while thou art here. And if thou find anything contrary to Christ's life and teaching, scrape it out with the knife of repentance, and write it better, evermore thinking that thou shalt give a reckoning, etc. Also, I say in principally that it were good to know what reward shall be given to the wise servants and good, and what to false and wicked servants, whereupon it is written that the Lord Jesus Christ shall come to the judgments in the same body that he took of Mary the Virgin, and the wounds that he suffered for our redemption, and all that ever shall be saved, taking again their bodies, cleaving to the head Christ, shall be ravished, meeting him in the air, as St. Paul saith. They that shall be damned, living upon the earth, as in a ton of wine, and dregs, and death beneath, and the clear wine hoveth above. They that shall Christ acts account of the deeds of mercy, reproving false Christian men, relieving them undone, rehearsing the deeds of mercy and other pains that his true servants have suffered in following him. Then shall those false servants go with the devil whom they have served, the earth swallowing them into the endless fire, and rightful men shall go into the everlasting life. Then shall be fulfilled that is written in the book of the privities. Woe, woe, woe shall be unto them that dwell on earth. Woe to the pain that gave the worship to deed images wrought with man's hand, and to other creatures that he shall have given to God that him made. Woe to the Jew that trusteth too much to the old law. Then shall he see the son of Mary, judging the world whom he despiseth and crucified. Woe to the false Christian man that knew the will of God and fulfilled it not. Also, woe shall be for the sin of thought. To thee that haste, shout out of thy heart the family of God, that is, mind of his passion, holy contemplation of his goodness, and memory of his benefits, that thanks therefore, and haste also, excluded meekness, petty gentleness, etc., and haste made thine heart a house of swine, and a den of thieves, by unclean thoughts and delights, thou here hast shout God out of thy house, so shall be shut out of heaven. Thou hast harbored the company of the fiend, and with him in hell thou shalt ever abide. Woe also shall be for the sin of speech, for that thou couldst not open thy mouth for foul and stinking sin to praise God in the fellowship of saints. Thou hast 
used thy speech unhonestly with cursing, fraud, deceit, lying, forswearing, scourging, and backbiting. For praising comely is not in the mouth of sinners, in the which, if thou hadst kept thy mouth clean, thou shouldest have song in heaven, in the fellowship of angels, this blessed song, Sanctus, 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 Dominus, Deus Omnipotens, that is, Holy, 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 art thou, Lord God Almighty. Now crying and weeping, thou shalt in the company of devils cry, Uve, 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 Quarte Suntendre, that is, Woe, 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 great be these darknesses. Woe also shall be for the sin of Wirtus. Thou hast been proud. Thy pride, as Isaiah saith, shall be drawn with into hell. Thou hast been brent with envy. Though envy through envy of the devil, death entered into the world, and they shall follow him that be on his side, as Salomon saith. Or thou be stirred with wrath, and every man that beareth wrath to his brother is guilty of judgment, as Christ saith in the Gospel of Matthew. Or thou hast been slow, and therefore disease shall come to thee as to the wayfaring man, and thy power shall be as of one unarmed man, saith the book of Proverbs. Or if thou hast been lecherous, a glutton, or a covetous man, know, saith Paul, that neither adulterer nor unclean person that is a glutton or a covetous person shall ever have inheritance in the kingdom of heaven, but fire and brimstone and the spirit of tempests, that is, the fiend of hell, shall be part of their pain. When these damned men be in this woe, they shall sing this rueful song written in the Book of Mourning. The joy of our hearts is gone, our mirth is turned to woe and sorrow, the crown of our head is fall from us, alas, for the sin that we have done. But joy, joy, and joy shall be unto them that be saved, joy in God, joy all among themselves, and joy one of another that be saved. Then are they happy. Oh, how happy are they, for that their travels been finished thorough Christ, which brought them to so gracious an end. Then are they happy, for that they be escaped the perils of the world and the pain of hell. Oh, how happy are they for the endless bliss that they have in the sight of God. Come, honor and gloria in secula seculorum. Amen. A sermon, no less fruitful than famous, made in the year of our Lord God, 1388. In these are latter days most necessary to be known, neither adding to nor diminishing from, save the old and rude English, thereof mended here and there. Preached by Thomas Wimbledon. Published in 1550. By Richard Grafton and Richard Keel.